Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Vegan Proteins, Muscles by Brussels Radio. My name is Jacobo. And I'm Danny. And this is episode 117. Welcome back. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode. We have so many cool things down the pipeline for May. Namely, we'll we'll continue our tour and travel to different spots. The next spot we got coming up is local, which is near and dear to our hearts because we don't get a chance to do local stuff too often. And we've been touring in the mainstream, but we're going to a veg fest. We're going to the New England Veg Fest. And we will be presenting, Danny and I will be doing a presentation on getting in your best shape yet on a vegan diet. We'll also have a table there so you'll get a chance to hang out with us, ask us any questions you got, whatever, this and that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Some other speakers there too. I hope you all know who Gene Bauer is, but if you don't, he was the founder of Farm Sanctuary. And there's also Juliet. Pennington, who is a journalist for the Boston Globe, Veg News, and an adjunct professor at BU, which is pretty cool. Her presentation will be on traveling as a vegan. Yeah, this is what, this is probably my favorite Veg Fest in the entire country. Actually, New England Veg Fest really does an awesome job putting together their show. It's only one afternoon, so that makes it very different than most of the shows we do that are not Veg Fest. They're usually fitness expos. They're full weekends. They're like morning till night. This, I think it's just like 11 to 6 or maybe even 11 to 5 or something. So you better get there. And if you want those vegan treats, you have to get there early to get in the line because that line gets to be like two hours long. No joke. Yeah. If you are literally not one of the first in line the second they open up, that line is almost like a quarter of the way through wrapping around the entire Expo Center. That's how wild it gets. Yeah, but we couldn't go last year because we were at a different show somewhere else. So I'm so excited to be back at this particular show. Yeah, totally. There's nothing cooler than getting to support your local community, especially when it's your local vegan community. So what are we talking about today, Danny? Today we're going to be talking about what I consider to be a big mistake that so many people are making, and they're not making it for a short period of time. Sometimes they're making it for like decades, and that's not an exaggeration, and that is the fact that people seem to think that the key to their dream body is dieting, that it's always dieting. The answer is always, well, I just need to lose this weight and the dream body is under there. And unfortunately, it's probably not under there and dieting is probably not going to get you there. Right. And it's not good for worse than your mindset. It's not good for your mental health to always be there, even if you're not actually dieting. If you're thinking about dieting or feeling like you need to diet, how healthy, like what's your quality of life there? You know what I mean? And how are you going to feel about your body if you're one step away from like trying to diet down and lose weight and or lose body fat? There are so many people that are just always on a diet. They are always on a diet and it's really sad, (laughs) honestly, to think of how many people have spent their whole life on a diet or trying to be on a diet unsuccessfully or however you want to put it. And I don't know if this is just a woman thing. Like, you tell me, Giacomo. Uh, I know that we work with a lot of men, too, but I feel like boys and young men are not told their entire life that they need to lose weight. Airs a different kind of shame and a different kind of way it looks when it comes to men. When it comes to women, I feel like it's much more pervasive in culture and much more spoken about, which I guess is pretty awful, if you will. When it comes to men, there's like this illusion that men are comfortable with their body and or just cocky about it so it's a lot more repressed when it comes to body image stuff with men and i'll tell you what by no stretch of the imagination do men not struggle with the idea of being lean and having a ripped six-pack etc right no i i get that and i'm not saying that men don't have body image struggles they don't totally 100 percent do and it's getting worse every day not better but I still feel like most guys who want to get in shape don't immediately think, oh, the answer is caloric restriction. Most of them, the first thing, and tell, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I talked to a lot of these people too. Uh, generally, the first thing they start thinking is, I need to exercise, I need to hit the gym. Not, 
I need to go eat lettuce leaves. Can't really argue that point too much, Danny. There's definitely an easier buy-in to the quote-unquote bulking or building muscle phase when it comes to men, for sure. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just curious. I'm not saying I know for certain, but I know for certain that women, when they want to change their body, the absolute 100% first thing they think is that they need to eat less and that they need to do cardio. Because they want to be toned. Not all, but some, right? Like that idea that you don't have to put on muscle to change your body and you can just diet away and look good. Well, see, you already lost me because that's not what toned means. Toned literally means revealing your muscle, which you must have first. I mean, women use that word toned a lot, and I don't think they, as a collective, totally understand exactly what it means. And that's not that's not their fault. A lot of times we're told, like, well, everybody has six-pack, right? It's just underneath the fat. Well, no, not everybody has a six-pack. Like, everybody has abdominal muscles. <laughs> everybody has muscles, right? Like, everybody has biceps. Everybody has quadriceps and lats. But that doesn't mean that they're developed to the point that there is any kind of shape worth seeing there at all without putting in some real hard work. So to think that you're just going to be able to be as you are right now and just diet and poof, there's going to be this beautiful svelte shape underneath is misguided. But since so many women work and work and work and work to achieve that for sometimes decades, really decades, I mean, they work and work and work and don't actually achieve that. They just think the answer is, well, I just never got far enough. I just didn't lose enough weight to see it. And that is incorrect. Yeah, totally. I, <laughs> I know where my mind's going. I don't know how relevant it is to this conversation, but Oh, there is a much easier trap that women fall into when it comes to weight loss and dieting down to get their dream body. Elaborate. Well, women are far less likely to embrace putting on muscle to well, change yeah. their body shape. And you can't put on muscle when you're dieting down. They're far more likely to buy into the idea that you, they can body recomp and or diet down and just have a combination of that for the next five years and get the body they want. Like that's possible but not probable like if you're trying to always and let me be clear here and not assume that everyone knows what i'm talking about when i say body recomp maybe some people are jumping in and you have listened to our earlier episodes body recomp means you're not actively trying to build muscle you're just keeping your body weight basically where it is and you're losing fat and gaining muscle more or less that's body recomp so if you're focusing on that or you're just trying to lose body fat meaning actively lose weight and hope that most of it's body fat the theory that I'm proposing, Danny, is that's not a way to build your body. Like you're going to be selling yourself short if you're always in that place. You're not just going to be selling yourself short. You are never going to get there. You're never going to get where you're trying to go. And that's the real like kicker of it all is people spending 10, 20, 30 years trying to achieve a certain physique that is it does not exist. It is not there. And you know, the heartbreak of these women just beating themselves up constantly for not being there when they've put in so much work. And that's the other thing. Like, <laughs> they're not sitting around doing nothing, expecting amazing results. They are working really, really hard and living in a state of almost constant deprivation in the hopes that there's this pot of gold at the end of it that does not exist without this very, very critical step or phase or however you want to put it that is deliberately building muscle eating enough and getting strong if you don't do that your dream physique it's not under there it doesn't exist and it requires what i think is actually a lot harder for most women which is eating in a surplus well, period. Yeah. period full stop i don't even have to add anything else to make it harder just eating in a surplus seems to be like a lot of women would rather get like a root canal without anesthesia than eat in a surplus for an extended period of time. Or accept the fact that not only have they been doing it the wrong way, now they have to go ahead and do what they feel like is backpedaling. So it's like spending the last, what, 5, 15, 25 years doing it a certain way, not getting the body they wanted. And then all of a sudden, 
they have to accept the motion around that and then move forward and actually be in a calorie surplus. Like that's yeah. a it's like a sunken costs problem, right? Like, no, no, no. I've been working towards this for 10 years. I'm really close. I'm super, super close. So I've already done this much. I might as well keep going. And it's like ugh, sometimes you have to cut your losses and realize that you just spent a lot of time not really moving forward and decide to move forward. But the thing that makes it exceptionally hard is that for all of this time that someone's been trying to diet their way to their dream body or whatever, they've been building up all of this like stigma and mental garbage around the idea of eating more. So now when someone like myself or you step in and we're like, hey, I totally see what you're trying to do, but this isn't the way to do it. What we're going to need to do is deliberately eat in a surplus. And they're like, wait, what? No, everything about that feels bad and wrong and terrible. And then they really, really struggle with it. I'll give you an example. I have this client that I've been working with for um, a while, and we have been deliberately in a muscle building phase because guess what? The 25 years of dieting that she was doing prior to this didn't really get her where she wanted to go. So we're deliberately in a muscle building phase, and she kind of slipped out of the habit of tracking, which can be okay. There's, it's not terrible to not track. If you have built up a really solid routine, sometimes you don't need to track. But she fell out of this habit of tracking and our progress really slowed down significantly. And I said, why don't we just like do an audit for a few days? I want you to plug in every single thing that you're eating and send that to me. And bear in mind, after 25 years of dieting, her, her, her caloric surplus is not a lot because she's basically trained her body to eat nothing for decades. So what is a caloric surplus for her would be a tremendous deficit for me. But I digress. So she plugs in all her stuff. She sends it to me. Day one is 900 calories. Day two is 1,050 calories. Day three is 947 calories. On average, she ate like 900 and change calories. But before she actually totaled it up to me, what she said to me was, oh, you're going to like, you're totally going to abandon me and write me off as a client. My carbs and fats are just out of control and blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, the following day she sends me the diary and I'm looking at it and I'm like, holy crap. Like, yep, your carbs and fats are out of control in the wrong direction. Like they are so, so, so low. It's no wonder we're not making this progress. But in her mind, She was dramatically overeating. And that is what decades of being in a restrictive mindset will do to you. It's like you're wearing funhouse glasses every time you look at your meal that tell you anything that if it's even remotely sustenance is too much and you're bad for doing it. And think of all the systems that you have to undo and change And the bias, the narrative that you've told yourself to get to where you are now, just because you've come to this aha moment or realization where you're actually getting the right kind of data on yourself because those hard questions are being asked and you're answering them truthfully and honestly, like, where does this leave you? In a really hard place. Like, even if you want to commit to it, what does that process look like, Danny, when you actually start to make a change? Like, how do you do it in a way where you're not going to self-sabotage or feel like crap, like you're marching through mud just to be able to actively work towards getting the dream body that you want? Well, I think having a coach or any kind of accountability partner is really, really, really important because even if logically you understand this is the smart thing to do, like logically on paper, I can see I need to eat in a surplus and build muscle. That's great. Once you start doing it though, those thoughts that can come in are really, really intense that you know, you've, you've overeaten, that you're gross because you are just eating like a slob. The scale is up a pound and a half today. I knew it. I look fluffy. This is squishy. I'm fluffy. I can't do this anymore. Uh, they were totally wrong. I have to go in the other direction. And I understand all of those feelings. I have felt those feelings at different points in my life. I think we all have, and that is why having some kind of an accountability partner or a coach is so freaking important because they will pull you off that ledge every single time. I have clients where that is like almost my entire job is to make sure they don't start dieting, not 
<laughs> not the other way around, not to whip them into shape via dieting. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have clients that need help with dieting too, but a lot of them, I am holding them back from caloric restriction every time we talk. Yeah. And I don't know. I feel like you could easily just throw this argument out the window and be like, well, just be someone who adheres and does what you're told and be a machine. Like, you know what you need to do. Just shut up and do it because logic, duh. One, that's not the whole thing. Like, how do you want, don't you want to feel good while you're marching toward a goal and achieving it? And two, it's not always that simple. You know, we are not our emotions. However, they are there. They are very much so there and they can muddy up the process and cause you to make the wrong decisions, even though you didn't intend on making the wrong decisions. And nobody wants to feel like crap, you know? So I think adherence obviously is king, so to speak, but so is making sure that you're feeling healthy and enjoying the process. Yeah, and it doesn't always feel healthy and it doesn't always feel good when you go to try on some of your clothes and they don't fit the same way that they fit two months ago and you're like, ugh, I'm clearly moving in the wrong direction. Like, it can feel like you are moving away from your goal, not towards it, even though <laughs> doing what we're talking about is the only way towards it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> This has been something I personally have been working towards since I was 15 years old, Danny. And even after my, what, seventh or eighth prep, I still have weird feelings every time I diet down and I get back to a healthy place and I bulk up. They still come, even though mm -hmm. I know full, I already know full right and well what I need to do. Yeah. Knowing what I need to do, I still have like moments where I'm like, why am I feeling this way? Why do I even have to bother addressing these feelings i know what i need to do this is stupid right but if i don't danny not only, not only do i feel like crap i wind up delaying what i need to do and i make the wrong decisions and like you, you time needs to be on your side the quicker you can come to the right decision and feel good about it and execute it here the better you know yeah and i think that's important to, like i'm really glad that you said that one because you're a guy two because you've been doing this for so long the fact that even when you are going through your period where you need to deliberately eat in a surplus, deliberately put on weight, even though logically you know this is the right thing to do, you're a coach, you literally have other people do this all the time, but when you're the one going through it, sometimes you feel like you're moving in the wrong direction and you have to deal with all of these uncomfortable thoughts and feelings around your body changing in a way that in the moment doesn't seem favorable. Yeah, yeah. And let me just be clear. I don't feel like I am going in the wrong direction per se. It just feels off. Like I know that I'm going to go in the right direction. I know I'm going to make the right decisions, but it's just taking too long to get there. And I'm feeling like crap all the while. And that messes with me. I don't like that. When you say you're feeling like crap all the while, you don't mean physically because physically you're generally feeling better. You mean like emotionally I'm, about your physicality. That right? is exactly right. Okay. Yeah. And you know, I don't think there's any shame in that. That doesn't make you stupid. And that doesn't make anybody who's listening to this and is nodding along like, yeah, yeah, I know I need to do that. But when I do that, I feel like I look worse. I feel this or that. That doesn't make anybody stupid. Like, look around at the world. Anybody getting larger for any reason, good, bad, anything in between, they are shamed. That's just what our society does. It sucks, but none of us individually are doing it. That's the world that we were raised in, whether we like it or not. You know, just like people are praised for becoming more intelligent or making more money. They are also praised for becoming thinner or more aesthetic. And the opposite is the opposite, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's not your fault that you deal with all of these feelings around it. But we are more than our feelings. Our feelings are not facts. It's okay to have them and recognize that they're happening and then still like use your higher thinking brain to make the smarter choice. It's not easy, but it can be done. So let's talk more about like literally why you cannot diet your way to your dream body. Less about the emotions, more about like why, why this will not work. 
Well, in order for your body, in order to trigger your body to build muscle, you need to tell your body that it is getting in more resources than it actually needs, so that it doesn't have to divert its resources to maintaining healthy energy levels and maintaining a healthy body. For one, I think that is the very first thing to wrap your head around. Give your body more than it actually needs, and it'll do more with it. It'll build muscle. Okay. I want to talk about why trying to just diet your way there is not going to work. So when you eat in a caloric deficit, well, let's back up, actually. Everybody has a body weight set point, okay? Everybody has a weight that their body is not going to want to drop below. I should say everybody has a body weight set range, really. Um, Once you get to the bottom of that body weight set range, it is really, really going to do everything it can to not get below that. So I can tell you for myself, the bottom of my range is 125 pounds. Trying to get below 125 pounds is so hard for me. Um, And there comes with lots of negative consequences. And I have a significant amount of muscle now. But when I was younger and I didn't have that muscle, guess what my body body weight set range was at the bottom? It was still 125 pounds. Because that weight, that number is going to be what that number is going to be regardless of whether you have muscle or not. Now, what do you think looks more quote unquote toned? Me at 125 pounds with significant muscle or without? With. Obviously, with. So when you're just trying to diet yourself down, you're going to reach the bottom end of your range. If you don't have the muscle there, you're not going to look the way you think you're going to look. So if you instead take the time to build the muscle and then eventually try to get lower, you know, get to the lower end of where your range is, you might not even need to get to the bottom of it to look the way you want to look. Um, Because muscle is denser, it's smaller, it's tighter, um, and (laughs) you're just going to have an easier time getting there because you're not going to feel the need to get below it because you're going to look the way you want to look when you're at it instead, if that makes sense. Some of the things that happen when you try to get below it, let's say you get you don't have much muscle, you get to the bottom of your range and you're like, wah, wah, this doesn't look the way I wanted it to look. I must just need to be leaner. So this is when everybody reaches this point. They just start dieting harder and harder and harder. You are literally slowing your metabolism down. At this point, this is where the metabolic adaptations really start to creep in. Your immune system becomes depressed. Your sleep becomes worse. Your mood becomes worse. Your performance becomes worse. Your digestion becomes slower. All of these things are your metabolism down regulating. You've effectively slowed down your own metabolism in pursuit of a body that doesn't yet exist. And now you're absolutely not going to build muscle in this place. Like your body is saying like abort ship, like, and it's not going to do you a favor and build you muscle in that position. Like, you know what I mean? And you become married to the idea of the image that you don't see when you're in that position. Your brain can't think about what you actually look like in that position because your body feels like crap. So your brain's not getting enough like brain juice to actually see what's actually going on. I mean, there's all kinds of problems here. You can just go one after another after another. So, like, if your body's in a crap place, you can't see what you actually look like. It's a dysmorphic place. It's I don't care how good you have your head wrapped around it. There's that. There's also the fact that you're in a depleted state, so your body's going to look like trash no matter what, even if you do have muscle to show for it, I think, at the end of a dieting down phase, if you don't give yourself, like, a month or two to breathe and, and see what your body looks like in a healthy place. So... You're just, you know, it's you're in hot water when you're dieted down and you focus on dieting down harder because your systems are working against you in short. It's as simple as that. If you're stuck in that place, you're not thinking about what you could actually look like. You're kind of just in this rut where that's that's where you wind up living. And guess what? You ain't gonna build muscle in that state either because your body's all kinds of messed up. Yeah. And then when you're in that place and you ha- you know, you've been restricting, you've been restricting, you've been restricting. And you have a day that's like an off day and you end up eating way over what you intended to eat. Your body is also now more efficient at storing these calories and storing them as fat because it thinks you're in some kind of a famine. Thus, just 
almost giving reinforcement to this idea, you know, you have a day where you eat 2000 calories or 2500 calories and the scale goes up and you're like, see, I knew it. I just needed to eat under 1200 calories. Like you're reinforcing your own bad behavior by doing this, by putting yourself in this depleted, depressed, metabolic state. And I know the mindset because I've been there. I, I've talked about this a lot. The first time I lost, when I first lost the 90 pounds that I initially lost, I went from 100 and, I'm sorry, 210 pounds to 120 pounds. And I was just like, okay, I look like wet spaghetti. Like, <laughs> that's what I was just like, okay, so I just need to firm this up. That thought, that thought right there of like, well, I kind of like, where my weight is at, but I just need to firm this up. That is not a thing. That does not exist. You cannot turn your fat into muscle. You can build muscle and then you can lose fat, but you're not turning anything into anything else. That's not how it works. You're not going to firm up your tricep like fat that's there. I mean, I had all of these thoughts and I'm just trying to steer you away from wasting a lot of the time that I wasted in that same place. And aside from your mindset and what that does as far as your decision making goes, how about the fact that eventually you're just going to keep losing muscle if you're constantly yes. malnourished? I don't yes. say malnourished, but like you're obviously not, you're not taking care of yourself in a way that it's, at, and you're not taking care of yourself in an athlete friendly way and in a way that is going to fuel your performance as an athlete. Mm -hmm. Well, that gets me into a whole separate kind of off topic, but I think it's worth thinking about if you get in that super, super restri restrictive state where like your weight is, you know, you're thin, but you don't like the tone of your body, you're skinny fat, essentially. And then you're like, uh, F this, I hate this, this didn't come out the way I wanted it to. And you have a couple of weeks where you just eat whatever you want. And you gain, let's say you gain six pounds. That six pounds was not muscle. OK, that was six pounds of fat that you just gained. Then you decide, oh, crap, I need to crash. I need to start crash dieting again. So you crash diet again. This time you might lose the six pounds. But how much of that was fat? Let's say four pounds. Let's say two pounds of that was muscle. You're now at the same weight you started with, with two pounds less muscle. You say, oh, I hate how this looks. I'm just going to eat whatever I want again. So every time you go through the, this like giving up on restriction back into crazy caloric restriction, then giving up on it and gaining weight and then back into crazy caloric restriction, you are ending up in a worse place every single time because you are gaining fat almost entirely. But you are losing fat and muscle every time you diet down. So you are putting yourself in a worse place at the end every single time. So what is the answer here? The answer is to let go of this idea that your dream body is at the end of a diet and try to embrace the concept of just eating enough to support your body and getting really strong. So focusing on a very, very slight caloric surplus. Yeah, that could be anywhere from 200 to 600 calories of a surplus, depending on the person, and really focusing on getting stronger in the gym, improving your food quality, improving your sleep. And I don't mean doing this for two months and then being like, okay, I'm good. I'm going to diet now. I'm talking about doing this for six months, 12 months, 18 months. Like, give it some time. I would never put someone into a build phase for less than six months. That's just a waste of everybody's time. And no matter how you get there, as long as you're in a surplus and in, and you're in a not dieted down state, you're going to be putting on muscle. Ideally, you'll do it the way that Danny just outlined because unlike dieting down, faster on the way up for bulking isn't necessarily the best way. The idea is that you are constantly in a calorie surplus. So in a worst case scenario, let's say that you get in a calorie surplus and you just gain a lot of weight really fast. Eh, you recomp a little bit at the end. You still have plenty of resources available at your disposal. You'll still build muscle. In an ideal scenario, though, you'll be in a calorie surplus, a modest, like Danny said, 200 to 600 calorie surplus for a long period of time so that your body is constantly in this place where it's like, ooh, there's more coming. There's more coming. There's more coming. So whether it's an ideal scenario or still a kind of way where you're just 
in a healthy place, you're still going to put on muscle. You know what I mean? As opposed to thinking, oh, I wasn't perfect. Like, again, just put yourself in a place where your body has lots of resources to work with and you'll put muscle on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will find that they really like the way their body looks just doing this. They might like it just with this. Awesome. If that's not the case, you might need to do a small cut after a solid building phase. And that's okay. That's different than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just that constant, never end, no end in sight dieting. That's not good. Deciding, okay, I'm really happy with my strength. I feel very satisfied. I don't feel very food focused. I feel like I'm pretty strong. Sleep is good. Maybe I can do a little cut and see if I can get maybe my weight a little bit lower, just shed some body fat, keep this muscle and see what that looks like. That's what I did at the beginning of the year. I hadn't dieted in five years. And I decided to do a little 10-week mini cut, and it was very successful. Everybody said, oh, my God, how, how did you do that in such a short period of time? And the answer is that I didn't do it for five years. That is literally, I don't have a secret, guys. I didn't diet for five years. So when I decided to do a mini cut for 10 weeks, it was so easy, it wasn't even funny. I just, you know, 13 pounds just melted right off of me with tiny little tweaks to what I was doing. And it was very easy because it was 10 weeks. It was 70 days. And now I'm right back to our regularly scheduled program. And the results were there. And I also want to celebrate what a, I'm gonna say bigger, why not? Like I'm not afraid of the word bigger. I wanna celebrate what a bigger body looks like that has muscle on it. Muscle will shape your body whether you are leaner or whether you are bigger, muscles just, you're just gonna look better. So you might be surprised over time when you focus on putting muscle on your body, how much happier you are with the way that you look, no matter what size you are, because it will shape your body. But I will add that as a natural athlete that doesn't use steroids or performance enhancing drugs, you are gonna have a hard time building, like, and by hard time, I mean borderline impossible time building so much muscle that you become big. You know, what we could say, like, nobody's gonna get big from having too much muscle as a natural athlete. So I think that's important to note too. Very important to note. All right, moving on to our question and answer segment here. Here we go, Giacomo. I did an arm routine today, and one of the stretches during the cool down was to clasp your hands behind your back, then lean forward and bring your arms up over your head as much as possible. I can barely extend my arms out straight after I've clasped my hands together, let alone bring them forward at all. What stretches would help me work on this? Sounds like a chest mobility issue to me. You could do a door frame stretch where you you bend from the elbow and you make a perpendicular angle with your arm and then you put your hand on a door frame and then you just stretch your chest out one side at a time and if that visual is not perfectly clear to you look up door frame chest stretch you can also stretch your chest out on the floor by laying on your belly and picking one hand up and then laying your hand out on the other side and then leaning into that side of your body to ch stretch your chest out. I don't know what the, you know what the name of that stretch is, Danny? I'm not, I don't know what the name of it is, but I would, I would just type in chest stretches, honestly. And that particular one, which I just did in a mobility class, I would just say lying floor chest stretch and look that one up. So yeah, tight chest muscles for sure. This one's for you, Danny. I want to get into weight training, but I have no idea where to get started. I have a gym membership, but I am too anxious to ask anyone for help. I have no idea what machines to use, and I'm clueless when it comes to terminologies. Is there anything I can watch or read for help? So I happen to know a membership that might be outstanding for you. Um, I would check out our Muscles by Brussels membership. If you have a gym membership and you're already going to the gym and you just don't know what to do, the Muscles by Brussels membership is awesome because everybody starts at day one. So you know, whether you're brand new or experienced, we want everybody to start at the beginning of the program. And there's both workouts for your home gym. So if someone just has dumbbells and a bench and a pull-up bar and some bands, there's workouts for that. But there's also workouts for the gym where we do incorporate a lot of the machinery 
that average commercial gyms will have and teach you how to use them, tell you how many sets and reps to do, tell you how long to rest. Then month two builds on top of month one, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we have people that are in year four of this membership and still making really, really great progress. Um, you would also get access to lots of lessons in there as well. Bonus materials that come out every month are live Zoom calls, which I think we're up to like four live coaching calls per month at the moment. And it is very, very affordable. It's our most affordable program because we wanted to make something that was, you know, kind of available to everybody no matter where they're at right now. So I know we already have like a little ad for it in this podcast, but it's in the show notes somewhere. But you know, it's no joke. We have over 100 members in it, and people really, really love it. So it sounds like it would be perfect for you. Are Lululemon leggings worth it? Do you to get new leggings soon and want something that will last? Might grab a crop-defined jacket. My puffer jacket is too hot often, despite winter coming. No icy mornings yet, but close. But need something that isn't a puffer or jumper or trench coat. Okay, I don't know anything about puffers or trench coats, but... Are Lululemon leggings worth it? Yes, they can be. Um, I would say go try them on. So here's my advice for Lululemon people. The Wonder Unders and all of the variations of the Wonder Unders are really, really good. They will last you forever. They are thick, but not too thick. They're squat proof, meaning they're not see-through at all. They're a little bit heavy. In the summer, I think, but they really do a great job at sweat wicking, but they're like over $100 a pair. The Aligns, the Lululemon Aligns, were my favorite. They are so buttery and soft and awesome, but if you have any kind of thigh rubbing together situation, you will wear through the thighs of the Aligns, and they're the same price. They're over $100. And Lululemon prides itself on, like, fixing your leggings if something happens to them. Guess what? They will not fix anything if you rub through the center of your aligns. They call that normal wear and tear. I disagree, but hey, there you have it. So the aligns are not worth it, in my opinion. And instead, what I have started wearing are Colorful Koala is the brand. They're like $20 to $25, depending on if they're on sale or not. They are soft and buttery like the aligns. I have not worn through the thighs on any of them. I have a couple that are like three years old and they're finally starting to get really thin um, to the point where I have to double check and make sure that they're still squat proof. But I mean, I've been wearing them for three years and they were $25. So I would definitely check out the colorful koala leggings if you like the aligns. But if you want to invest in a couple pairs of the Wonder Unders, they're really great also. They're just pricey. All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Vegan Proteins Muscles by Brussels Radio. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at veganproteins.com. You can hit the contact button or email us, coach at veganproteins.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at Vegan Proteins, at Muscles by Brussels, at I Am Just Athena, and maybe more people coming soon. Hey, hey, keep your eye out for that. That's it. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Danny. And I'm Giacomo. And we will talk to you soon.